four million learners. In the last few minutes, I want to talk about a different subject that occurred to us that yes, healthcare is critical, but even more important than healthcare is public education. Education of children is more important than healthcare. Why? Because their educational status is the key driver for their healthcare status. And here, what I'm trying to say is that public education is the engine for justice. It has the power to reduce poverty, improve health, solve climate change, strengthen economies, combat racial inequities. It can do so many things. Educating a child well is like the magical key for this world. So literacy, just one part of education, is the opportunity. And it's, you can't separate it from freedom. So we started launching Echoes for education. As you heard, three countries now do it. We have um, 27 hubs. They launch, there are 67 networks going on just for education. And I am so proud to say that Oklahoma State University has taken a leadership role in bringing echo for education, showing us the way how you can mentor teachers. So what do, what do we do? We have 37% of those networks are for behavioral support, school support, training school principals and leaders to be better, uh, superintendents to be better leaders, early childhood education, instructional support, indigenous education. So take an example, what we've used it for, math, science, reading, autism, educational leadership, including resilience, social and emotional learning for school teachers. We've used it for trauma-informed care in community schools. Used it for early childhood language development and many, many other implementations in education. Our dream is that every child must get a good education. And I think with the use of technology and mentoring and democratizing best practices in education, we can do that. So really what makes ECHO work is team-based care. We make community teams to do this work. Task shifting, we want every school teacher in the world to have best practice knowledge, be constantly updated with the latest scientific evidence on how to teach math well, or geometry well, or literacy, etc. Interprofessional consultation is the idea that because of the efficiency of technology, many experts can help you. you don't, you're not limited to one mentor. You can have many mentors helping your development. We believe that interprofessional consultation guided practice, teaching your daughter to drive a car, and mentor-mentee relationships with ECHO can produce have a opportunity to fundamentally transform human performance. All human performance will improve if you can provide these three things, interprofessional consultation, guided practice, and mentor-mentee relationships. But I was meditating on this question, why is ECHO working so well? Why is it being adopted? And I realized that the real reason ECHO was working was it was a social network. It was building communities of practice. It was producing joy of work. And I like to say that what produces value in ECHO is not just knowledge, it's love and respect. And for experts to sh share that knowledge with the world and democratize it is a sign. And spending time with mentees is a sign for them there they are being loved and respected. And that is what actually produces the value in ECHO. ECHO is a movement of all teach, all learn, of demonopolizing knowledge. And I really invite you all to join us. I invite all of you who have any expertise to consider starting ECHO projects to democratize it for the good of the world. And one of the things 
most important slide that I share with people to convince them to start ECHOES is this slide. Albert Schweitzer was a physician. He worked in Africa, and he said something interesting, which really struck me when I read it. And he says, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I do know. The only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. You know, what really struck me about this quote wasn't that service is a good thing. What struck me was the only one amongst you who will be really happy. That's a pretty strong statement. And I found that to be true in my life, that serving others produces a lot of joy and happiness. And I know that any of you who get involved in ECHO will have the same experience. We want to change the world. We want to bring more equity. We want to make the world better, all aspects of it. And a really good place to start is to sharing expertise and knowledge. Because the difference between knowledge and money is that knowledge has a different physics. When you share knowledge, it grows. It multiplies. So you are richer too. And we can start the sharing economy in this world, starting with knowledge. Because right now, there is enough knowledge to share and make it grow. There isn't enough money to produce equity in the whole world. And that's the way we want to start. And what gives me hope that we can change the world is that this quote by Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, nothing else ever has. And I invite you all to be that group of small, thoughtful citizens with us to change the world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Rora. This, a um, lot of food for thought for us, and we're gonna uh, digest that a little bit, maybe, hopefully. And uh, we're gonna have a panel discussion, and as I mentioned earlier, you can uh, text questions, and I think that information was already up, it is up there. Um, any questions that you may have, and those are gonna our mediator back there is going to mediate those to me, and I will uh, try to get all your questions, but I may not get to them. But right now, <clears throat> I'd like to introduce our panel who will help us digest this food for thought. So um, first, I'd like to introduce Dr. And so please come up. Uh, please, in fact, panel, just come on up. Um, first, yeah, you'd have to, yeah, I don't know if you can see your name plates here. You know where you're seated. Okay, great. Trained professionals up here. First, I'd like to introduce Michael Stanton, who already introduced Director of Education Programs at Project ECHO. Next to Mike is Tara Jackson. She is the Director of Project ECHO here in Oklahoma. She joined, uh, Oklahoma State University Center of Health Sciences Project Echo in 2017. She's responsible for implementation, growth, administration, and evaluation. And when it comes to Echo, she is sort of, I ask her what, she's sort of my boss, I guess, if I have a boss in Echo. And so um, she is, she's a fantastic leader, too. We, I, I learned a lot about leadership from her. Next to her is Robin Miller. Chief Deputy Superintendent of Public Instruction, Oklahoma State Department of Education. Robin holds a doctorate in curriculum instruction and began her career teaching high school English and later served as professor and dean of the College of Education at Oklahoma Christian University. She has many roles, uh, just a few of those. I, we don't have time for all of the hats she wears to discuss those, but uh, she oversees educator effectiveness and as we know uh, what this is about, professional development. 
And one other important role she has is she's a hub team leader of one of the most successful echo education programs, and she'll tell you a little bit about that. Next is uh, Tessa Chesser. Dr. Tessa Chesser is a hub team leader for infant mental health, ECHO, co-team leader for the pe uh, pediatric behavioral and emotional health, ECHO, and the help for the healer, ECHO. Again, we, these people have many hats. Uh, she's a so Tessa is a, an associate clinical professor at Oklahoma State University Center of Health Sciences, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. We have Dr. Lance Fry. Uh, Lance is a commissioner of, this, of Oklahoma State Department of Health. So Commissioner Fry, we're very privileged to have you here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fry is a medical doctor who serves uh, as commissioner of health and is a fellow of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He received his doctorate in medicine from Loma Linda University School of Medicine and joined the Air Force in 2005 later serving as state air surgeon and deploying in support of operations enduring freedom and Iraqi freedom. So these are our distinguished panel members. So I thank you for being here. Our, my first question to you is a lot, when we talk about Project ECHO, for those that don't know anything about it and you're trying to explain it from scratch, it's like, to me, it's like explaining a prime color that no one has ever seen before. So let's just talk about your individual journey and how you got into ECHO. So it probably helps us understand what ECHO is. So uh, this time I'll sort of go in order, but after this it's I'll teach, I'll learn, okay? So Mike. What? Thank you. Um, in 2015, I retired unsuccessfully, I'm still working, but I retired as the founding principal of an innovative high school in Albuquerque and began working with the public ed department. I, I, you know, I had this vision, having been able to build a school from scratch to kind of help the greater good in other ways, maybe at the state level. So I started doing some consulting and contracting with our state department and wound my, the director that I was working with said, why don't you sit down with me, come to Albuquerque, um, and we will hear something called Project ECHO. It's mainly for medicine, but maybe there's something in there for us to be able to connect with teachers and help with professional development. So we sat there and, and uh, my professional degree, my doctorate was in adult learning theory, communities of practice, instructional learning, collaborative problem solving, and I sit down hearing the first 90 minutes of Dr. Aurora's speech and it was, or, you know, presentation and I was sold. You know, I drank the Kool-Aid and I jumped in. Had the opportunity to 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 really be one of the first to to seriously transpose the medical model that he described to you into the area of education. Uh, this was back in 2017, and uh, to begin those pilots and and kind of build in that quality improvement element, and with his generous partnership and support and. He and his team kind of wrapped their arms around me and said, look, let's try it here in New Mexico. If you could help be a champion for us, let's see where it leads. And so I guess I did a pretty good job. And so now I'm the uh, director of education programs for Dr. Rohr at Echo Institute, uh, helping folks in New Mexico, in the U.S. and, and around the world to, with Ed in partnership as well, to, to re be able to, to take this model and, and in, in include it into their own practice to, in their own professional networks. I am Kara Jackson and I'm a doctor of public health and I was implementing a statewide public health program and it was just difficult. I needed to reach rural providers, I needed to reach providers in um, underserved areas to get this information to, and then in addition to getting ju them just the information, we needed to su provide support while they were implementing these programs. And it was very difficult. The state's big, and it was very difficult to kind of drive around and meet everybody. And so um, I went to um, a session at OSU. Uh, it was a summit they were having about Project ECHO. And it was like a silver bullet. It was just like the answer key. 
And so um, I think after that I said, I need to um, learn more about this and I need to be a part of this. And so I then proceeded to find people to get the job. So I did get the job, so very happy about that. But I think the overall, I just really like searching for these in innovative approaches to public health. And with that, it's health and education. So that's how I got started. So at the Department of Education, uh, I first learned about this model or this, this protocol um, probably three years ago. And I think the, um, the word that resonated with me was rural. So access uh, for our rural schools to have um, expertise. And uh, we have about 540 school districts in the state. 75% of those school districts are considered rural. And then um, most of you probably know that there are, there's a sort of a rural and remote aspect uh, in, in the four corners of the state. And so very intrigued uh, three years ago about that access um, for our educators, specifically uh, knowing that we have a teacher shortage. We also have a principal shortage. And so uh, when you can bring professional development to new educators uh, or and or um, tackle a problem of practice in the education world, it's extremely compelling. So I first heard about ECHO when I was on an interview, actually, for OSU. And I remember going in the room and seeing the education piece and seeing the consultation piece. And it really hit me at that time because I had been doing education and consultation for about uh, 10 years at that time, but separately. And when I saw it be put together and the, the power that it had when you put those pieces together, and met on a routine basis. I, as Tara did, drank the Kool-Aid about that time. <laughs> and I was really excited. I was like, let's start this for pediatric psychiatry. Let's start this for infant and early childhood. We can make such a difference in the state. So I, I first became uh, aware of and involved with Project ECHO when I was still uh, chair of the department of OBGYN at, at Oklahoma State University and uh, had uh, two residency programs I was, I was running at the time and also having you know, uh, lots of medical students come through. And you know, we had, even though we were in Tulsa Metro, um, it was not easy to find timely care and advice on, on treating patients with either mental disorders or uh, substance abuse. And so we started presenting cases on Project ECHO. Uh, we'd have the residents present, and uh, it was a great experience for them, a good learning experience for them. It was uh, a very uh, innovative, unique way for sharing knowledge with those residents and being able to give uh, best practice, uh, evidence-based best practices to those patients that were in, in, in real need. Um, I then, at, later on, I got deployed down to, uh, for the COVID response through the National Guard and was on the Governor's Solutions Task Force, and one of the things I was asked to do was to figure out how to communicate uh, all the evidence-based knowledge, the best scientific knowledge at the time, to everyone who needed it, to know it in the state of Oklahoma. And so, um, at the time, President Shrum uh, and I were talking about it, and she uh, asked me to use Project Echo. So we set up the COVID, uh, COVID Echoes in order to share that knowledge to people who were in desperate need of it throughout the state during a time when there was a lot of misinformation. And so uh, that was incredibly impactful and have just, uh, just I can, I can see, I have so many ideas of where we could go with, with Project ECHO throughout the state to uh, improve um, many, many different outcomes. Very excited to be here. All right, thank you. Um, in, my, in my trying to explain this uh, 
prime color that no one else has seen, I, I usually get a couple of standard responses. I want uh, not all of you need to, but maybe those that uh, have the strongest opinion about these uh, answer it. But one is, uh, I've been part of many, many webinars. I've already, I've already been doing this for years. What makes Project Echo different from a webinar? I'm going to call on Tara on that one. <laughs> I, I, was gonna go. I, I know that she has a lot of emotion in this particular one. Uh, everything separates it from a webinar. Everything. <laughs> everything. Okay, good. I have that answer. Good. <laughs> so um, we use the same platform. Everybody knows Zoom now. So that is the, what probably is the only similarity. Um, it's facilitated by. Um, usually a subject matter expert in a field that really engages the audience. Um, it's all about collaboration. It's all about, uh, it's not one directional communication. The whole idea is that we have a dialogue. We really get in and get to know each other, get to know the case and really uh, get to work at that. It's all about respect, it's all about respect, it's all about respect. Um, it's very caring. Um, it's, again, it, I think the big part of it is that interactive communication and that dialogue that's created that um, where people feel safe to share um, vulnerable situations and where people can actually get to the root of um, a problem and actually uh, create that, that learning curve for them, so. Okay, good. The other, other uh, and this is usually from uh, doctors or people in the health profession uh, this always uh, comes up. I, I also have a, an emotional reaction to this, but, and I'm not even in medicine, but this question is this. Uh, telemedicine has been going on for many, many years. I've been doing it for centuries, maybe not that long, but telemedicine has been going. What's different in tele, or excuse me, Project Echo and telemedicine? Doctor, I'll go ahead and yeah, answer go ahead, that. Dr. Chesser. <laughs> So I've done telemedicine several years as well, and I see it as completely different. Um, usually when we do telemedicine, we're with the patient, you know, it's patient to doctor um, over the, the internet. But in this way, we are actually creating this team of providers that learn from each other. And not only do we learn from each other this one time, we learn weekly. And so there's exponential growth of our knowledge and then exponential growth of how we care for our patients as well. And so you can really see that, that growth along the way where you might not see that in just um, telemedicine. Okay, good, thank you. I wanna ask some of the questions that uh, our audience has provided. And uh, these, I didn't give you these beforehand. So uh, one of them has to do with curriculum. Is there a set curriculum or do you just sort of change that as you go? So I'll start there. Is there a, how, is there a curriculum to this? In, uh, in the education echoes that we've done over the last five years, I think we began you know, with the main overall driving question of our community of practice, which is another answer that I give for what makes a difference, is uh, you know, w was the theme. So uh, improving the graduation rate was our for very first one. Um, and so that was more open, you know, we, 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 well, it started as a cohort and being kind of that expert, I wouldn't compare myself at all to Dr. Rora, but we were on a shoestring. It was me and a person that Dr. Rora loaned and his t IT team. And so, you know, we just had, you know, just to kind of get that curriculum going, I, I just called on people that I knew and had them come in and do presentations on something important related to that theme um, of improving graduation rate in, in career and technical education as it was. And so in that case, we had more of a closed cohort. We listened, we did a lot of quality improvement. So each, each, after each session, we wanted to hear what our participants wanted to know. You know, what, what did they want to know more about? So the beauty of ECHO for us was we were able to be responsive almost just in time. Within a week or two, I was able to come up with that next great per person. And, and these were presenters from all over the world and or all over the country in particular 
that uh, not just in New Mexico that were able to, to come in. But more recently, as we're looking to, to really change the world, as Dr. Rora said, in literacy, for example, our focus in education at ECHO Institute is to not only share the, the education model of ECHO, but also, you know, we're, we're kind of the incubators there in, in taking on a program, especially the literacy in grade three, four, and five, and putting together world-renowned uh, experts in literacy to improve practice. And so we're building that curriculum, but it's gonna be open source, right? So when we share ECHO, you don't have to pay for it. You know, all the presenters, all the participants are able to join at no cost, and they'll be able to, you know, when we partner with other universities, like in the medical model, uh, we'll be able to share not just the model of ECHO, but also some tools that have been researched, studied, proven, improved in our quality improve, improvement process that they could take away and, and really have that deep, meaningful impact in literacy, math, science, uh, social and, you know, the early childhood space, uh, school leadership in particular. Okay, thank you. I have to say this, uh, uh, Echo Uruguay, Super Hub is watching live, and uh, they wanted me to give you their regards, Dr. Rora. So, Uruguay. So I guess maybe we'll hear from others too. Uh, another. Okay, here's another. Is a good question, and I honestly don't know the answer. We're getting most of the questions we're getting has to have to do with education, but I think there are implications for every everyone on on the panel. But um, could this be, is ECHO used in pre-service educational development? In other words, educating, teach, e educating pre-service teachers while they're in college. Do you know if that may be to you, Mike? Is that going on anywhere? We, uh, one of the things we, we've taken from Dr. Aurora's leadership is that residency kind of model um, and including those students who are in, in the graduate schools in, in particular, because they're also practicing you know, in the classroom or, or school leadership and so on, but also those undergrads and, uh, and inviting them to come in and join. We've had some really wonderful successes um, in the teacher preparation program at the University of New Mexico's College of Ed, working in collaboration with the, with the professors there and some of their students. Um, especially in the Native American area. We, it, much like Oklahoma, we have a, a large Native American indigenous population and they need, you know, just as much, maybe even more, as you heard some of Dr. Rora's figures, um, that support those teachers. Uh, I, I saw the new teacher center and we've been collaborating with them on that, that kind of model. So there's some great models out there. And one of the beauty of, of being part of the ECHO network is we share those ideas. I got to meet Tess earlier today, and she's one of the leading experts in the country in early infant and early childhood mental health. And we're beginning to design a program in that area in New Mexico, and we can work with each other in collaboration so that truly what Dr. Rora's concept of de democratizing knowledge is happening within our ECHO networks as well. We have, <clears throat> we have, some, act we, we have some deans from the College of Education here. So, Robin, can you think of any ways that, say, in our state, working with universities that we could um, do pre-service education through ECHO? Oh, absolutely. And I know that we've had uh, uh, colleges of education and, and their uh, pre-service teachers involved in some of our uh, sessions. Um, I, I think that, um, Again, when it comes to our state's um, teacher shortage, as well as just um, high quality instructional materials, access to high quality instructional materials, uh, equitable access to all of those things, uh, certainly um, we need uh, pre-service teachers involved in that. Okay, very good. And maybe we can Learn. Um, I believe it is the case, uh, but isn't ECHO involved also, say, in pre-service uh, physician education? In other words, before a person gets out of med school, that they are they have ECHO things going on. Uh, 
or Tessa, the, or or, or any, any of the, the medical doctors up there have anything to say? Or Tara? So the medical students do come to both of our ECHOs, and I think that they're required to go to so many to help them understand the model, so that hopefully they'll continue to use it throughout their training. I don't know if you've used it with residents some. We have, but uh, it was when we were when we were presenting, we were using residents and medical students to help us with the presenting. Mm -hmm. So they're they're exposed to it uh, definitely during their training. Okay, Tara. And Dr. Fugate uses it. She's Dr. Colony Fugate here is here, and she's the um, lead of our pediatric obesity medicine echo. And absolutely, the residents participate, get to know the model, get to understand get training, first of all, but get to understand how this will help them once they go into practice in their rural communities. Okay, I, I think in education, I think we can all see uh, and pre-service before they get to the field, before they get into schools and while they do their uh, residency or uh, and student teaching that we could employ that there. So we can think about that and talk about it. Um, all right, and I, I get, I'm going to bring, do, I'm going to go ahead and bring Dr. Aurora into the conversation because a lot of these things uh, sort of pertain to him too. And so, first of all, Dr. Aurora, uh, based on some of these things that you've heard, do you have anything to add to some of these things that we've already brought up? Yeah, I think that, um, to be quite honest, uh, Dr. Robin Miller's role here is critical. What we have found is that those echoes are extraordinarily successful where the executive branch really supports the universities, whichever they may be, uh, to set up an infrastructure uh, at scale so that this scale infrastructure can be used by anyone who has the desire to democratize their knowledge to help these teachers. And, um, and in our case, you know, for example, um, what Mike, uh, Dr. Stanton was talking about, our um, governor has a priority on early childhood education. And they've just given us recently $2 million, a million a year for two years, to set up this infrastructure because, and so for all the people here who have a role in the executive branch, I, my plea to you is to please take this model to your governor, whether it be in health, as Dr. Fry, you could do, or there is a very, very key player sitting in the back of the room quietly. His name is Johnny Stevens. Dr and uh, welcome, and he has played a very important role to bring ECHO here with President Casey Shrum. And I, I think that adopting the model by the executive branch for things like education, health, public health, can actually have a transformative impact in reducing cost and enhancing effectiveness all at the same time, but also an argument that has been very effective in New Mexico, and I wanted to share with the people of Oklahoma, is that this is one investment in the universities which actually helps the rural areas, as you said, rather than an investment in the university that helps Oklahoma City or helps um, Oklahoma State University, the investment of infrastructure, but it, it is a really good idea, I think, for the executive branch to invest in this infrastructure, and now is a particularly good time because many states, especially oil-producing states, have some revenue that is coming in, and so that we lay the train tracks down in the state of Oklahoma that in the future we can run many trains on it, whether it be the equity train or the um, so that would be one, um, one thought that I have to share. All right. Another question that has come in, uh, and I think any, uh, Tara, Mike, or maybe Dr. Aurora on this one, uh, we saw on the map 
the number of of medical echoes across the world, you know, and it sort of, and in our in the U.S. Thankfully, we have a, we have a lot of it blocked in, but we, there's also some blank spaces. The question is, do you believe echo and education can see as much growth as health echoes? You know, there was a public uh, PBS documentary on echo, uh, and in that, this was about two and a half years ago, I said what I truly mean, and it's so now in the record, that I believe the ultimate impact of echo for education will be far greater than echo for health. And I still believe that deep in my heart. And the reason is this. Currently in the United States, you may be shocked by this number, but only 34% of children at the third grade level can read. There is scientific data which show that if you cannot read at the third grade level, it is extraordinarily difficult to catch up. Now, when you divide this number up into race, only 45% of white children can read. 19% of Hispanic children can read. 18% of black children can read. This much inequity if left untapped will continue to cause disturbance in our society of all different natures. So this is not in my view, this is a game changer. If we focus our, if I had to choose just one or the two, I would choose education over health because I hope I never have to make that choice because I want to do both. But education echoes will change the world. And I invite all of you and I invite the deans for School of Education and others to really use it to have scale so that, um, and my dream is that in a state like Oklahoma, every school teacher has an interest and a mentor. So that what happens is, not every teacher can become an expert in everything, but what if someone said, I'm an expert in literacy, another one said, I'm an expert in, in um, early childhood, I'm an expert in this. They can choose their one echo, have a mentor, and become an expert, but everybody should have this opportunity and that requires the kind of investment at scale to build the infrastructure. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> one thing that I will ask, and maybe um, some of the edu people on the panel, or I wish I could ask all the people out in the audience too, but you can text the answer if you want to. Uh, in education, I think that would, be a, that would be a game changer. I think that would be a major paradigm shift because many teachers, they're probably experts in their, their own classroom. They probably don't consider themselves experts that would be teaching others, that would be mentoring others. And I think it was like you were saying, uh, you became an expert after being exposed to this, being mentored for a couple of years, and now yeah. you're an expert in, in a certain area. Mm -hmm. And so I think it would be a major paradigm change if we could, um, instead of just teachers being experts in their classroom, we have a whole state full of experts in education that are mentoring others. All yes. teach, all learn. All teach. So that's my dream. And so if you have any, any, any comments on those, any? Okay, Robin, what do you think? Well, I, I do think that this model has allowed us to take data literacy to a, a level that we never thought we could. So, for example, our first echo um, was really all about our school report card indicators. And so, I guess this was school year 2019-20, um, and then it, it became, uh, we had to cease that in March of 2020 for obvious reasons, COVID-related, but um, each month, twice a month, uh, we would, um, hold sessions that were very specifically focused on school districts' contextual data. They're looking at their data and um, specific to the report card indicators like graduation rate, um, reading sufficiency, English learners. Um, and again, you know, it has, this model has allowed that 
level Good. of data literacy to just uh, expand and go through the roof. Thank you. Very good. One, another thing that was mentioned, Dr. Orr, the idea of equity. Uh, Robin, I know equity is sort of a, a big thing with you. Uh, have you seen, I mean, you're, you're the hub team member of Tele, uh, leader of Tele Edge. Uh, do you see ECHO as an effective equity strategy? Absolutely. So our, our ECHO is called TeleEdge, and that's named after our strategic plan, which is our state plan, um, Oklahoma Edge. And, uh, you know, I, I think rooted in that or embedded actually in our strategic plan, uh, we have equity traits uh, measuring what matters, um, looking at equitable access to effective educators. Uh, I already mentioned the access to high quality instructional materials. And so, um, again, this is a model that it helps uh, that equitable access. And, and even when it comes to school improvement in the state, our uh, lowest performing schools in working with them on improving, um, it certainly is helpful as far as um, an equi equitable resource review that is something that we do, kind of a, a rapid response uh, review, uh, and, and we're able to do that via um, our TeleEdge. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else have any comments on the, ec the equity aspect of ECHO? Uh, I have a question for Commissioner Fry. How can we better leverage what we're doing in ECHO to serve Oklahoma better? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, something that what I love about Project ECHO is it is bold and it's innovative. And if we want to move forward in the state, we have to be bold and innovative. And, uh, you know, we, I'm just gonna use health as, a, as an example. You know, we've consistently ranked near the bottom of the rankings for uh, health ratings in, in the state of Oklahoma uh, in, the, in, in the United States for as long as I can remember. So if we don't do something new, and we just keep doing what we've been doing, we're gonna get the same results. We have to be bold and innovative. There are so many ways that you can leverage Project ECHO in the state of Oklahoma to uh, make improvements. It's really, you know, sky's the limit. Uh, you know, we're talking about education today, but, you know, everything about ECHO is about education. It's about education. It always has been. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think about um, so many things. For instance, you know, we, uh, until, until now have been one of the few states who did not have a mandate for health education in, in our schools. Well, that's a, a, an incredibly important, great place for Project ECHO. It's a new, it'll be a new, um, a new project that we haven't done in the state and they need to have, you know, evidence-based, late, latest practices taught mm -hmm. throughout all of our schools so they can pass that knowledge on. All right, That's just you. one example. You could go on. There's so many ways. We have um, a question here. Very good question. All right. Educators aren't just, we've been talking about, about a, a lot about classroom teachers, but educators uh, aren't just classroom teachers, but also school counselors, school nurses, um, and they didn't have this, but a school math teachers, even coaches. And so, but all of these people sort of in their own disciplines also feel isolated too in what they're doing. Both in their context, they're sometimes isolated and definitely statewide they're isolated. So how could Project ECHO be used to sort of, sort of be interdisciplinary to sort of help all the disciplines. It's sort of like when we uh, had all the things, all the, uh, the medical conditions now that ECHO has. 
How can educators do that? One of, I think one of the examples, and I think we heard a lot of it in all around the country during this uh, pandemic has been the term social emotional learning, right? Especially of students and the trauma of having to be isolated and quarantined and, and away from school at all age levels, but also social emotional learning and health for the educators going through all the stress that they've had. And that was a great for us, starting in that March, where we quickly, much like you did, Ed, uh, launched two or three ECHO programs each week for educators to stay connected and to support them with these ideas. And we found right away, it wasn't just the classroom teacher, but we had school counselors, social workers, special ed teachers, assistant principals, deans of students. It really was a great, you know, cornucopia of, of, of folks. And when you get that kind of different frames of reference and points of views and needs and questions, it just brought this wonderful, rich discussion in that community of practice. So we made sure that our presenter in that 20 minute workshop or didactic, uh, you know, were, were able to meet the needs of everyone and, um, you know, from their, their point of view or as best as we can. And then the case-based learning presentations were also in that great, that way. Now, not all subjects can be or you know, themes can be held that way, but there are some that I think really reach out. Um, there, I'm sure there's others in, in examples that here in Oklahoma though. All right, thank you. Let me ask you, and, and, and uh, we'll ask the panel first, and then Dr. Rohr will have a chance to answer this. Three to five years from now, what will be different, if anything, about echo delivery and who is being served? And also, the counter that what will be the same. And so, I'll, whoever would like, Tara, would you like to start on that one? I think we all might say similar things, but um, I think obviously in three to five years, there's going to be a lot more growth um, for Project ECHO, and it will just, just expand beyond other fields. Um, even though it's still in the realm of healthcare, we're starting a farmers and ranchers uh, ECHO as well. So it goes beyond, we're going into, you can go into agriculture, there's, you can go into any realm. Um, and clearly, it can just continue to grow globally. Um, what I think is the same is the heart of the project, um, the passion of the people to, to share their knowledge um, and continuing doing that and just creating this respectful environment for people to learn and grow in. Okay, very good, thank you. Robin? I'll just follow that with uh, the what would be or hopefully would be the same is uh, the the network and the the learning community that aspect um, something that uh, we at the Department of Education are excited about is that um, we don't have um, like some other states do have regional professional development centers we don't have those and so um, we do one uh, annual conference uh, in the mm -hmm. summer and we've, we've gotten innovative and we take that on the road. So we take our professional development conference to uh, educators all over the state. But that's just once a year. What this ha is allowing us to do is to, you know, if it's a summer uh, conference that we continue to deliver in the future, then the tele-edge, our echo, uh, can follow up, you know, even month uh, after month until the next session. Um, so that is extremely exciting and something that I'm hoping, as you said, you know, would grow in that regard. All right. Thank you. Tessa? Yes, I, I think more disciplines as well are going to be involved in ECHO, but I also think we're going to see this growth in collaboration with other ECHOs, so not just through the super hubs. We've already started that in the infant, in the infant ECHO, combining with other infant ECHOs across the country um, to really provide that gold standard care. Um, we've also expanded our disciplines from day one. We said any discipline that wants to learn about infant and early childhood mental health can come. 
And so we've really got, I want to say about 18, Tara would probably know, Jade would know actually, how many disciplines we have on that. But I think that's going to continue to grow and we're really pushing into the early childhood education world as well. All right, thank you. Commissioner Fry. Believe it or not, there are still a lot of people who you talk to, even though you have so many super hubs and, and uh, other ECHO projects around the world, there are a lot of people that don't know what ECHO is and still ask. Uh, and so I see that it's going to be commonplace. I think everyone should uh, have knowledge of ECHO and understand it and hopefully uh, participate in, in an ECHO of some, some way or another. And for that to happen, I know that we have, for, uh, we have some technology that we need to work on to get there. We have uh, areas of our, of our state that we have worse connectivity than some very remote areas of the world that I've been in. But so I think that in five years, we will have uh, much better availability to reach every person in the state of Oklahoma. All right. Yeah. And speaking, yeah, you brought up the uh, what is ECHO, and I just want to make, I'm a little bit I'm a slow learner here. I just want to check with Tara. It's not uh, the webinar, right? We're <laughs> not webinar. Okay, good. Thank you. Absolutely not. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Mike. Um, I was just thinking just now, you know, looking to the future, kind of being old and gray in this career, but looking to the future of uh, that map that Dr. Aurora showed of 600 med you know, of those 605 hubs, all but 35 or 60 of them are, are, um, are medical. Uh, what, would it, what would the world look like if we had 600 education hubs around the world? And what, you know, that going back to the theme of changing the world and, and the improvement of that one slide of uh, equity and economic improvement and the health and wellness of this world in just a few I think in just a few short years we could be there and that uh, I'd love to be able to see that Dr. Rohr what how would you answer that question by December 31st 2025 1 billion people will have been helped by echo so that's one statement for the future second I anticipate that there will be enough broadband in this world, that any person, and I want to say hello to the people from Nigeria, in Nigeria, in Sudan, in rural villages, everywhere in the world, bandwidth and video connectivity, which is essential for ECHO, because ECHO's relationship-based, will be available. It will be available, it will become commonplace for someone to be able to turn on some device in their pocket and connect by video anywhere in the world, and be able to do it at low cost. So I see that. But third, most importantly, I'm hoping that the world will realize that democratizing expertise, what really is the role of an expert in the world is the question. It's a really critical question because as Dr. Johnny Stevens, who's a pharmacist and you know, now leads the Health Science Center knows, the dominant paradigm in the world for experts like me is that knowledge is power, knowledge is fame, knowledge is money. So what do we do with that knowledge is we monopolize it. We keep it to ourselves. We sell it to the highest bidder, sell it piecemeal. And I'm envisioning a different world where the role of an expert is to mentor other, and an expert should realize that this great knowledge we have is a gift we have received from the universe, and that we use that knowledge to mentor other people to become as good as us. That is, we call that idea force multiplication. The idea for me as an expert was, you know, I'm a world expert in hepatitis C, but the only people I can treat is the people I see myself. That was constraining. I wanted to serve many more people, and the only way I could do that was to change who I was from just a widget piecemeal maker to mentor for other people to become as good as me. And I think that paradigm, changing that paradigm in agriculture, as I'm so excited um, 
that you are starting an echo in agriculture, um, it, it is the same paradigm. The role of an expert in this world should change because there are too few of us, Ed, and that will change the world. Very good. You mentioned Nigeria. We have uh, three individuals in our audience tonight who are going to start the first echo education um, uh, line in Nigeria, and I believe it's the first in the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. And so their, their vision is not just to change, their vision is first to change Ni Nigeria, but also to change all of Africa. And so these three gentlemen in, that are here, in very interesting guys, they will do it. They will do it, I promise you. Um, speaking of the many things that echo the many disciplines, one of the things that I look very hard for, I could not find it. It's an echo in panel moderation. <laughs> and um, I looked everywhere. I could not find it. Um, I went to, I went to you know, lynda.com. I went everywhere. No, nothing in panel moderation. So, based, since I didn't find one, I'm going to, my last question to you is, if what question did I not ask you that you hoped I would that you really wanted to say something about? What is it that we have not covered that you want to say something about? And so I'll write that question down if we have it for next time. We can start a echo in, in a panel moderation. Anybody? <laughs> Okay, um, in the infant and early childhood world, I've seen ECHO break down silos. Um, infant and early childhood has grown across the nation in the world right now. As there's been a big push, we know that there's a 13 to 1 return on your investment if you invest in early childhood. And so there's just been this huge push in, in treating and helping little kids age 0 to 5. And so I've noticed all these silos pop up with great education and training and all these, all, these, um, all of these different treatment modalities all working separately. And it's been amazing to watch these last uh, year and a half, this last year and a half or so, uh, all these silos breaking down. And I've noticed that as we've gone from kind of like 20 people that came weekly to like during COVID, we're now at like 75, 70, 75 people come weekly because they want that collaboration and that um, spirit of giving knowledge. And, and so it's been really great to watch some of the silos break down in that world. Okay, thank you. Lance? You know, I think, just thinking back to my experience with the residents and, and students, I think a lot of times there's a fear of being judged so they don't want to really participate. Hmm. Um, and so I, I just want to stress, you know, what everyone here has said, that it's, you know, it, it is not about that at all. It's about a collaborative, caring environment and sharing knowledge. And uh, it's always very respectful. So if there's anyone that ever has a concern of that, it, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't be concerned at all. Thank you. All right. I think that you know, you have to kind of you just give it a try. It's a very, again, welcoming environment. We do introductions and get to know each other. Then it's just a very, again, back to the, it's not a webinar session. It's <laughs> just a very brief, like 15 minute didactic presentation on an important uh, subject, like Dr. Roar had mentioned. And then it's just a dialogue and about a case someone's having difficulty with or an issue with a school or something the teacher is encountering. Um, and it's all de-identified. We don't know who the patient is. We don't know what the school is. But, um, and if someone is a, is, does not want to present their case of fear of being identified, we can always present and help, help with that too. So it's always worth giving it a try. Um, I welcome you giving uh, an echo session a try um, and feel the experience that, you, that people have during an echo session. Okay, good. Mike? Well, I think you did a great job moderating. Well, thanks. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> I, I was. But, but you, you know, one of the questions that we both have been grappling and you didn't ask today is how to, you know, we, we know this is a wonderful idea. We know it can change the world. 
But how can you, how do we convince, and we know some of the answers, but how do we convince educators or the nurses or especially all the educate, you know, the medical practitioners in this very, very difficult year and a half, everybody's gone through almost two years now. How do you convince educators and teachers who have been really ch going through this challenging time that spending another hour or an hour and a half every two weeks w is good? and you know to volunteer their time and to really make that commitment because it will help change their lives we know it will but how do you get that first message to them and and uh, it's you know there's there's some answers out there we've got some great ideas and thoughts but i think it's one for i think another discussion another session all right robin did you have a chance to say anything well i would just echo what echo echo <laughs> uh <laughs> what uh you just said as far as the time, you know, I think all of us, regardless of what our <coughs> professions are, um, you know, time is very valuable. And I think once an individual uh, logs on and, and realizes that it is a trusted space, it is collaborative, I think then, you know, one realizes that this is worth my time. And so I think little by little that that is happening. And I know you just talked about an increase in, in one of your sessions as far as numbers. Um, but, you know, maybe there's a need for a, a communication campaign, you know, actually messaging what, <laughs> what this is and what this does and how mm -hmm. valuable it is. All right, thank you. And Tara, you had a chance, right? Mm -hmm. All right, I think the panel did. So, Dr. Rohr, I'm going to give you the last word. Uh, so, pretend I asked you the question that you would love to answer in your, in the, what you have on your heart that you would like to share. I'm going to pretend you asked me how am I feeling right now, and I'm feeling enormously grateful to you, to all of you, to have a chance to meet you and spend this uh, afternoon with you and thank you for your time and I really um, am excited about our way forward for ECHO in education. Thank you. All right, thank you. All right, as we conclude I, our program, I have a few final announcements and thank yous. Uh, there's a feedback form and so your input is very important to us. We, this is something, by the way, I don't think I mentioned this, but Dr. Rohr is our 20th laureate. This is our 20th year. And, um, and we try, on your feedback on these things, we try to improve each year. Um, so we encourage you to use the QR code on screen to link to a brief survey. It's very brief. Even though I'm a professor, I promise you it's a brief survey. And for those of you in the live event, you'll find the code on the handout on, on your seat. I'd like to recognize several individuals who've contributed greatly into the planning and development of this year's Brock Symposium. Uh, President Carson from uh, University of Tulsa is not here, but Karen, we thank you for giving us your very, very best in the planning here. Uh, incredible staff, uh, from the technicians that we had today to all the planning uh, special thanks to Susie Thompson, James Hollinger, and Mora, uh, excuse me, Mona Chamberlain. We thank you so much. Uh, my team, uh, Kate Schwark and Cindy Schaefer, thank you for your great help in this. Uh, this was a group effort. Uh, we had people from University of New Mexico. We had Jack Allen and uh, helping us, and so this was a group effort to get us here today and to have this seminar. So I want to also thank all of you who have joined us, both in person and virtually on this. Uh, and please remember, as John emphasizes quite a bit, John Brock, is the most important thing we do in life is educate our children. And so please drive carefully from this event. Uh, we, we will be around. Uh, if you don't have to get off real quick, we can talk a little bit Are you with some of our uh, panelists or Dr. Rora. So I wish you safe travels. Go Cowboys, Golden Hurricane, and Sooners. Get them. <laughs>